I was planning on talking about uh, three topics, um, and uh, it was originally two, but then somebody gave me a paper that Professor Doughton had written maybe a decade ago on leadership, <coughs> but it was in the medical profession. Was it in the MJA, I think? Yes. And I thought, well, gosh, you know what? I, I really ought to say something about leadership. So I'll, I'll start with that and then skip through a few of these slides. But the other two uh, topics, I want to talk about innovation and entrepreneurship um, together and then talk about how some of the templates that we use uh, were helpful in the setting up of ResMed and uh, growing the, the business. And um, uh, so let me start with leadership. Um, and um, it, it's, it's, it's so vital, um, as we've seen, and I don't want to get into politics necessarily, but I'm, I'm just delighted uh, with the last election um, in the sense that we have uh, adults back in charge. Um, <laughs> but it, the, so the, the best... Um, and, and the best um, uh, leadership... Um, uh, or the, or the best article on leadership was actually a very short article uh, by uh, Paul Johnson, the historian, um, who was at, at Oxford with Maggie Thatcher. And for those of you uh, that don't know a lot about Maggie Thatcher, I actually had the privilege of spending a bit of time with her in San Francisco um, a few years ago, and she, and she is absolutely delightful, and she has a wonderful sense of humour. Anyway, uh, the article by Paul Johnson, who's uh, an historian and was an advisor to, to Maggie Thatcher, and they're both at Oxford together, and, and uh, Maggie Thatcher did chemistry, so she had a scientific background, and um, Paul was a little bit on the left side. He was sort of um, uh, quite left, actually, and pro-union and so forth, and he said that working as an advisor for Maggie Thatcher for a number of years and watching her and, and how she did her work, he said um, he distilled the, uh, uh, the essence of leadership. And it was an article, gosh, it was years ago in Forbes. And he said that um, he had distilled the, the elements of leadership into five specific areas. And he said the first one was moral courage, which means you've got to have principles. And if you're going to follow your principles, you do need moral courage because it's easy and we've seen how special interest groups just rob people of, of, of democracy in, in essence. Small, little, and I won't go into details there. The second thing he said uh, you need is judgment, which is completely different from IQ, although being smart helps, of course, helps in life. But uh, it's, it's, it's sensing what the right thing to do is and actually doing it. The third thing he said was the ability to, to pick those items, those areas that you just have to get right. And you, every one of us daily, you get, you, you get an avalanche, a tsunami of things, but you've got to figure out, and, and particularly over the long term, what are the things that I have to get right, whether it's for a legacy or whether it's to actually get the job done for which you're being paid for or whatever. And I think the best... Uh, um, sort of, um, if you like, guidelines there are the, the Pareto, the 20-80 rule. And Vilfredo Pareto was a, an Italian economist in the early part of the 20th century who, um, who f was first to, to talk about the 80-20 the rule and he said that 80% of the income is earned by 20% of the Italian people. And so that's where the 80-20 rule came from. But in our business it's actually the 10-90 the rule that 90% of our business actually comes from about 10% of our, of our customers. Uh, could I ask for a, a glass of water, please? Um, actually, make it a beer. No. Uh, <laughs> um, and and this, this, the, the leadership stuff isn't here. Uh, so the third thing, the, and then the fourth thing was having the persistence and determination to finish the goddamn job. That is, once you selected those things that were important and you had to get right, Make sure you finish the, the damn things. And the fifth, and I could give you each 100 guesses as to what the fifth is, and I should stress that it doesn't follow from the first four. 
what is the fifth element of leadership? And I, I would defy any, anybody who wants to, to hazard a guess, that's fine, but it's, it's not something that's intuitively obvious. Um, it's having a sense of humor. And if you, can't, if you can't laugh at yourself and laugh at the world, you've got a real, real, thank you very much, you have a real, real problem. And I guess another way to put it is, you have to laugh at life because nobody gets out of it alive. <laughs> anyway, that's my um, two cents worth on leadership. So now I'd like to talk a, a bit, and, and admittedly this is a biased view of, of the world. Um, okay, so I'm not sure what I was supposed to talk about. An entrepreneur's journey on the road to medical... Well, whatever it is. It, 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 maybe some of that will come through. Okay, so I'm going to start with a, a quote from Aristotle. In the Greek, no, not in the Greek. <laughs> it is the mark of the instructed mind to remain satisfied with the degree of precision which the nature of the subject permits and not to seek an exactness where only an approximation of the truth is possible. Hard to believe that Aristotle was a business major. Um, in other words, I mean, it's very clear, don't fool yourself with numbers. The future is unknown and unknowable, but you can fashion it into a what's more likely to happen. And whether it's a business or a campus or, or, or a, a research institution or whatever, picking the important things to do, not knowing exactly how things are going to unfold, but very, very important. Okay, so what innovation and entrepreneurship. Now, Jean-Baptiste Say, and interestingly enough, um, um, Thomas Jefferson, when he set up the University of Virginia, tried to hire Jean-Baptiste Say as professor of political economy. He was so impressed with, with his book on political economy, he said, we've just got to get this guy out to Virginia. Anyway, he said that what, what in fact uh, an entrepreneur does is shift re economic resources out of an area of lower into an area of higher productivity and greater yield. In other words, you're making better use of the resources that are available. That's one way to look at it. So what do entre entrepreneurs do? They create value. And this is very, very, very important because often business schools, people talk about entrepreneurial risk. What a bunch of crap. Entrepreneurs don't want to get into risky things. They, they, entrepreneurship is about opportunity seeking. And so if you're inside the tent looking out, it's an opportunity. If you're outside the tent looking in and you don't get what people are trying to do, it looks like it's a huge risk. Entrepreneurs see a little bit further over the horizon than the average Joe. That's what it is. And you place bets on that you can actually put something together and make it happen. Now, what is innovation? So Ted Levitt at Harvard Business School said, oh, it's thinking up new things and innovation is doing new things. Not even close. The guy who got it right was Watts Humphrey, who was a software engineer at IBM. And he said, innovation is, is the process of turning ideas into manufacturable and marketable form. Exactly. Unless somebody writes a check, innovation does, has not, and will not, and never does happen. So innovation requires creativity, it requires imagination, but it doesn't happen unless somebody writes a check. You're actually delivering value, and I think it's so good I'm going to write you a check. The marketplace is the ultimate arbiter in terms of whether innovation occurs or not. And unless that happens, it's wheel spinning. Okay, so now, generally, innovation and entrepreneurship require technology. Now, if we apply technology to what we already know and it's done more efficiently, it's called productivity. Pretty simple. Now, if we apply technology to... Um, wait a minute, did I go back there? If we apply technology to something which is completely new and it's successfully put into the marketplace, it's innovation. And, and I cannot tell you how important technology is to us. I spent yesterday at ResMed, and I was just blown away by, by what people are doing. We've got about 1,500 people here. We've got a 30-acre campus uh, at Bella Vista. It's worth visiting if you... And the new stuff there, I mean, I, I, mean, I you read it and say, so, you know, get the, the, you know, the monthly reports, et cetera. 
And, but when you see it, it's just, it's just, it's just fantastic. It's orgasmic. I mean, to to see the people working on the new stuff and getting it done. And Bob Solo uh, at MIT, who got the Nobel Prize for showing that over a 60-year period in the United States, he could only explain 20% uh, of, the, of the growth of, of what was happening using conventional economics, like inputs and outputs. And he said, there's something else, I don't know what the hell it is, and it's like, it's the 80% of it, it's, and it, it, it was, in fact, innovation and entrepreneurship combined with technology that, that did it. And you can think of many, many examples of that. Um, okay, now, where do, you, where do you put your time and effort? And this is from Andy Grove. And Andy Grove came as an immigrant, a Hungarian immigrant, to um, New York, could hardly speak a word of English, and he ended up doing chemical engineering at CCNY, and then went across the, the country and ended up at Berkeley and did a, did a PhD at Berkeley. And he's a chemical engineer, and he's one of the founders with George Moore of Intel. And he became a microprocessor guy. Um, and I, I think chemical engineering, not, not because I did it, but I think it is the arts degree of technology, and if you disagree with that, that's fine. I don't care. But it is, there is some truth to that. Okay. So th this is a reverse time on the, uh, on the um, asymptote, and on the ordinate, uh, the ordinate is dollars. Now, if you, if you get late into a big area, you can make it work. If you get early into a small area, you can make it work. If you get late into a small area, it is a complete dog. You cannot make that work. Where you want to be is early into a very, very large area. And that's where we ended up with, with sleep disorder breathing, and I'll come back to that. OK, now, in, in choosing um, what we invest in, what we buy, and we've bought dozens of companies, and we've invested in, in dozens of small companies, less than 20%, typically 15. We like the technology, we'd like to keep abreast of it, we'll put a few shekels in just to keep abreast of what people are doing. And in some cases, we end up buying the whole company, as we did with a company recently in Dublin called Biancomed. But I don't have time to go into the, the details, but one needs a template. How the heck do you make a choice between things that you want to spend scarce resources on versus letting stuff alone? And, and this, is, this is just a template that's worked for us over maybe 30 years. And it is, the first thing is, 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 are we talking about a big market, but more importantly, is it accessible? If you cannot see a way through the thicket, it ain't going to happen. It'll never happen. You're better off just leaving it alone. People, do we have access to world-class people? Now, typically what we do here is we'll get, we'll get people from MIT, Stanford, Oxford, whatever. We'll have, we'll have a, a, um, a, an advisory board meeting. We've decided what we want to do. We have a game plan. But what we want to find out is if we're drinking our bathwater or not. So the best thing is to buy the brains and the experience and so forth of a bunch of smart people in the area which you're focusing on get them into a room so they can interact, you present all the stuff that you think makes sense, and hear these people out. And it's surprising what you find out. It's, it's really surprising, and it's worth the investment. Um, finance, can we see a path to the end game? And you do not have to have all the money you need for the end game, but you have to have a, 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 at least a concept of risk management. If you, if you reduce the risk, the value of the idea increases in value. In other words, de-risk something that's important, the, the value goes up. It's, risk comes down, the value goes up. Now, you don't have to have the money, but you've got you to have an idea of where you go to find it. It might be going to the marketplace. It might be doing an IPO, whatever. Or it might be simply going to one of the big guys and trying to do a trade sale. We've got a billion dollars cash. Hell. We, we, we want to divert our resources into some risky goddamn thing that, that we never know if it's ever going to work? Forget it. We're not going to put good people onto something which is high risk. If the risk comes down, we're happy to pay a huge multiple. Because the, if we can slot it into something where we have receptors of understanding, it's perfect. 
but we only do it if it makes sense. Um, timing, very important. Will it happen in our lifetime? Now, this is more acute for me now, and I start to look forward. I think, oh my God, are we going to invest? Anyway, but we call it the 4 2 rule. You have a robust business plan, it takes you four times as long and costs you twice as much money, or you can flip it around. It costs you four times as much money and only takes you twice as long. And trust me, this is just, this, this thing applies all the time. In fact, on the plane coming out here um, from, I was up in Singapore, and um, I, Harvard Business School did a, uh, a case study on ResMed, and it's 10 years old. And there's a buddy of mine who was, uh, who was a Harvard um, B-School guy, and he was, I don't know why he was presenting this case, but he sent me, he said, by the way, do you, you remember this uh, 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 case study that Harvard did on you guys? I'm going to present it at some damn thing. I, you know, could you make a few comments on it? And so I, I downloaded it, and I read it on the plane, and I, and I thought, oh, my God, I couldn't. Our, our revenues at the time were $155 million. This was 2002. The case study was 2004, and, uh, and I, then I looked at the, the people that were working on stuff, and we were looking at sleep disordered breathing in, in cerebrovascular disease, stroke, and sleep disordered breathing in cardiovascular disease, where in heart failure it affects 100% of the patients, etc. And here we, we were doing all these pilot studies, etc. And I thought, oh my God, 10 years later, I can go up to our current revenues, which are 1.5 billion, and we're still doing the same goddamn thing. And I didn't, I, anyway, I didn't throw up, but I felt like it. Um, technology assessment. What does the competition know and how could the competitive terrain change? But also, do we have the right IP? Do we, have, do, do we really understand this area and are we the right guys to do it? And you've got to be very realistic about that. And then the alpha factor. And this is not stuff that they teach you in business school. The alpha factor is you need a very, very, very high tolerance for bad news. Lots of bad news happens. Lots of bad news. And you've got to get up in the morning and you've got to say, God damn it, I'm glad I got into this business. I love it. Because the, I hesitate to use it, the shit does hit the fan. And you have to be prepared for it. Now, there's not, not, not a lot of things that get held up on that filter when you apply the, those six points. And then when you do that, you've got to do a robust financial analysis because at the end of the day, that's how you make the selection. Now, you can pick your own poison. Uh, break-even analysis, if you never hit break-even analysis, that's a bad sign. If the NPV, the net present value is negative, not a good sign. And then you can do Monte Carlo techniques or economic value added or whatever. They generally all point to the same thing. And the, the, the thing is, the innovation needs to be exciting, but it also needs to pay the rent. And if it doesn't pay the rent, or you can't, you can't see a way for it to pay the rent, let it alone because it's a, it's a lemon. Okay. Um, Jack Welsh, also surprisingly, another PhD chemical engineer, University of Massachusetts and University of Illinois PhD. Long time um, CEO of General Electric. And he said, if I could measure three things, it would be customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction and cash flow. However, if you dig down a bit, they're all interactive. If you have negative cash flow or you have unsatisfied uh, employees, you aren't going to have many satisfied customers. So, there are, so this is a bit glib. It's all interactive. But cash flow, boy, that's the, that's the blood that runs through the corporate veins. You have to understand cash flow. US GAAP is just crap. Why? Because it's, 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 it's uh, invented by accountants. It doesn't tell you how the business is running. In fact, US GAAP is a joke in a, in a lot of ways. And I, I don't want to go into it now, but it's, 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 we report US GAAP numbers, but I mean, cash flow. And we do generate $120 million a quarter free, free operating cash flow. So that's kind of company. That's nearly half a billion dollars a year. So that, that actually makes me feel good. Uh, and you don't want to waste it. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly, how much time do, you know, 10 minutes, perfect, perfect. I can race through it. Okay, so ResMed stands for, for respiratory medicine. So we're, we're in the, the, the respiratory medicine game, but we're really into sleep disordered breathing. So our mission 
is to become the global leader in the development, manufacture and marketing of innovative products for the diagnosis, treatment and management of sleep disordered breathing and chronic respiratory care. That's it. And that's all we're into. And people say, are you going to get into other areas? And I say, well, um, at 26% prevalence in the adult population, for adults between the ages of 30 and 70, that's the prevalence. This is the biggest public health problem on the planet. There's nothing that even closely compares with it. Sleep disorder breathing untreated causes hypertension, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, nocturia, getting up a lot at night to take a pee, impotence, cognitive dysfunction, depression, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux, and blah, 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 blah. It affects every single medical silo, and the medical silos really do. I mean, how many urologists, if a patient, a patient is complaining about nocturia? How many urologists, so you're a male, you go and complaining about nocturia. You got a finger up the bum to check your prostate. He's going to give you a sleep test. Everything happens below the umbilicus. You get the finger. You, you don't get a sleep test. It should be standard of care in every single patient. Every single patient. And I could go into this in huge detail, but I don't have time. OK. Now, um, the triumvirate of health. And the bottom line, I, I was in Japan listening to Bill Dement. Bill Dement is Dr. Sleep at Stanford. Wonderful guy. He did neurology and psychiatry at the University of Chicago. He's an undergrad at the University of Washington. And he, he, he did his sleep work um, in, in a lab at, uh, in Chicago where REM sleep was discovered. Uh, Azurinsky um, was, was they were studying cats, cat brains, and discovered in the mid 50s, the rapid eye movement sleep was discovered. And Bill happened to be there, and of course, being a neurologist, what do you do? Well, it's like a carpenter, and with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So when he set up the first sleep lab at Stanford in 1969, he started with EEG. I mean, electroencephalogram. Why? You're a neurologist. Why not? And of course, it's all, it's all uh, a surrogate measure. And the thing is, if one has an apnea, so what's an apnea? Snoring, we all know about. <laughs> The upper airway is closed, no oxygen going in, CO2 is building up. Actually, that's an area where CO2 is important. <laughs> we found one. I'll leave you with a question. How, do, how can you declare a crop nutrient a pollutant? <laughs> it's insane. But anyway, so we're back to sleep. Um, so Bill said, and he was talking to a bunch of um, uh, internists, primary care physicians, and he said the triumph of he said, even the dysfunctional kids in the California K through 12 system, which are taught nothing, um, much, because they've got remedial help to get, you know, if they get into Berkeley, they need to be taught how to read and write. But anyway, um, so good nutrient. Most, most kids know, even from the dysfunctional California schools, that high fiber, low fat's a good thing. By the way, there's no evidence that that's the case. In, I mean, there's no prospective huge clinical studies in nutrition. It's, yeah, it's probably okay, except then you look at the Japanese and they smoke like fish, eat bucket loads of salt and they live longer than most people. And look at the French, drinking like fish and eating lots of liver and so on. Anyway, uh, leaving that aside, uh, physical fitness. Everybody knows if you... If physical, physical fitness is great. Being physically active is you sleep better, generally you work better and, and things work f better for you. Healthy sleep. Now... Most people, if you have a bad night's sleep, you feel terrible. What about if you have a bad night's sleep every single goddamn night? You feel, frankly, suicidal. It is absolutely awful. And sympathetic neural activity, which, which is what wakes you up, because you get raining catecholamines throughout the body, vasoconstriction of, of the skin, the liver, the kidneys, and, and vasodilatation of the brain and the heart. It's actually not a good thing when it happens four or five hundred times a night. So I'll leave you with that pleasant thought. Okay, so we started as a management buyout from Baxter. I got Baxter into the sleep business. It's actually, I, I'd love to tell an anecdote of when I 
first ran into Colin Sullivan, because we were doing a lot of gene jockey stuff, like acute myeloid leukemia with Chris Jutner at the University of Adelaide. We were working with Gus Nossel on uh, porcine uh, islet cells for type 1, type 2, mainly type 1 diabetes, and I was doing the kidney stuff that, that I knew something about, at least once I knew something about. Um, anyway, uh, we got Baxter into the business. Baxter sold off the respiratory home care division for which we were developing this whole thing for. And I read about it in, you know, like 10,000 employees. I was one of the top 50 or something. And I'm reading a, a, a publication. Baxter sells off a respiratory home care division. I said, what? Anyway, it was going to die. And so we had a decision to make. Do we, do we just run with this ourselves uh, or do we just close it up? And uh, we, we ended up, um, actually, I, we decided to, to buy it. And um, so we were dealing with the Baxter... Uh, m a people and so we went on for six months we were writing checks to lawyers and and accountants and so forth and finally i, I got exasperated and i called up the, the president of, of baxter it's morning here and afternoon back in chicago and jim tobin was his name and and jim later on became ceo of boston scientific and i said jim this is just a bunch of crap i mean how can something simple like this take six months he said well what do you want to do and i said okay We'd like you guys to have 30% equity and, and, and then we get the other 70%. He said, no equity. And I said, oh. I said, okay. Um, okay, look, we'll, we'll write you a check for 500 grand and then we'll pay a 5% royalty uh, profit after tax over X number of years. And he said, okay. I said, oh. I said, that's okay. He said, yep, under one condition. And I said, well, what's that? He said, when you're next through Chicago, I want you to buy me a beer. And I said, well, wait a minute, Jim, are we talking import or domestic? <laughs> and, it, and it happened within three weeks. So, okay, our first year, now we had, a, admittedly, we had a little bit of a leg up because we had a prototype. I'd spent Baxter's money on this. We ended up paying Baxter exactly 1.5 million for this opportunity uh, when we finished the last check. And I'd already spent one and a half million bucks with the Baxter's money on the prototypes anyway. But so the first year, 1990, we did a million in revenue. We lost about 250,000. The next year, we did two million, lost 150. And then the, in 92, we did four million and we made 400,000. So we were line ball after year three. And we never took any VC money, vulture capital money. And uh, we, we just had an, one, one angel investor and we put our own money in. And that was John Plummer. John put in a million bucks and I think he made 50 million out of it, which is not, not a bad multiplier. Um, so we grew 100% in 93, 75%. And then we did our initial public uh, offering on NASDAQ. And our market cap was 85 million and revenues around 14 million. And then we switched to the NYSE because we'd get a better profile and uh, less volatility. <laughs> that was a farce. But anyway, uh, we did get a better profile, we think. Anyway, today we're 1.5, over 1.5 billion with a net profit after tax of 300 million a market cap of $8 billion, and we're the leading innovator in this. It's probably close now to, to $4.5 billion, uh, sleep disorder breathing, and, and we sell 700,000 masks a month and about 200,000 devices in 100 countries, and we do 70% of our manufacturing in Singapore for our devices and 50% of our masks and 50% of our motors. Why? Because we don't like manufacturing in communist countries like the United States and Australia. Um, I, I talked to Rudd just before he got in, and it's a, it's a, bit, it's a long story, so I won't tell the whole thing. But, but I, I talked, I said, I'm a bit concerned about you trying to reunionise the country. He said, what? He said, do you have AWAs? And I said, no, we don't. And I said, we have common law agreements. He said, yeah, he's right as, you're as right as rain. I knew the guy was just pulling my, well, bullshitting, actually. So I sent the guys straight up to Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore. We ended up... We started manufacturing in Singapore in 2008, and at the end of this year, it's going to be 70% of our masks. We have 30 acres out at Bella Vista. We are not getting rid of anybody. We are just not expanding there. And our tax rate in Singapore, we started at 17%. It's, it's actually wonderful. You sit down with the Economic Development Board, and they say, well, what are you going to do for us? And we say, blah, blah, blah. And they say, OK, if you do that, we'll, we'll do this for you. And we get students from national university, et cetera, the, the average employee there is better, is better than the best ones we get down here. They, they like to work. They're wonderful people. 
the Economic Development Board works with us, and if we need to talk to the Prime Minister, we can even do that. Where you've got a pro-business government that's trying to help you and not putting heaps of regulations and treaty and a goddamn nanny state. I, I hope I'm not sounding too political there. Um, all right. So revenues in the America, I'm gonna go quickly here. So we, we gotta get the US right, and we gotta get Germany right, and we gotta get France right. We're in 100 countries. 80% of our revenues are in three countries, except the US includes Canada and the Americas. We don't give a damn about the other 97. That's not true. We're growing fastest in India and China, but they're small markets. We have the number one and number two position in all major markets. And we did hit the Forbes 200 best small companies in America for 10 consecutive years. And, and small, by the way, for Forbes is, is $750 million or less. It's kind of a different uh, reference point for small, but we just got too big. But 10 years in a row, it's not too bad. So we're in Helsinki, Tokyo, Delhi, blah, blah, blah. We've had 74 consecutive record quarters. Yesterday, we just fi fi finished our 75th. I'd like to tell you how we're doing, but I can't. Um, and we're listed, at, we're, we're the 35th, I think the 35th biggest company on the ASX. We have a dual listing on the NYSE and the ASX. Our 10 year compound annual growth rate is 15% for revenues and 20% for net income. And we now have 5,000, 4,000 people and 500 in R&D, most of it being done here at Bella Vista. Uh, have I got five minutes? Three. Three, okay. Among specific sleep disorders, the most serious. Now, this is, this is 1993. You'd think the medical profession would be banning the, uh, manning the barricades. An editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1993, 20 years ago, saying that among specific sleep disorders, the most serious in terms of morbidity, mortality, is obstructive sleep apnea. It's time for the nation to wake up to the staggering impact of sleep disturbances on the health and welfare of our society, an impact that rivals that of smoking. Wow. Anyway, that's some of the signs. I went through that. Depression, good, reflux. I want to die like my grandfather did, peacefully in his sleep, not screaming like the other passengers in his car. <laughs> this actually may seem like a joke. 50% of truckies driving those 18-wheelers have clinically significant sleep-disordered breathing they're driving 18 wheels. So next time you're driving down the freeway and you look in the rear view mirror and you see one of these puppies, get the hell out of the way. He's a, these guys go spontaneously into REM and luckily most of the time they wake up. But sometimes they don't. When, when you read about the bus driver who's done this route dozens and dozens and dozens of times with a bunch of kids in the back and he goes over a cliff. What do you think happened? Didn't get a grease and oil change? The guy, this time he didn't wake up. Uh, sleep disorder, I mean, it's just, it's 20, I went through these numbers. I mean, it's just, in every single comorbidity, it is just monstrous. Look, 70, stroke, 75%, COPD, 30%, overlap syndrome. Anyway, misdiagnosis all the time, all the time. Sales products, are we, masks, lots of good masks. Quattro, it sells like, Hotcakes, all the, okay. All, all to, I mean, you don't want to, th these are fabulous products. Take my word for it. Okay, you go. Okay. On time, almost. Summary. Sleep disorder breathing in OSA is a major public health problem on a level equivalent to that of tobacco smoking. Untreated STB OSA is a major cause of hypertension, the major cause out of nine identifiable factors. This is on the NIH website. Major cause of heart disease, stroke, the number one and number three killers in most Western countries. It also exacerbates metabolic syndrome, in other words, diabetes. Easy to diagnose, easy to treat, and has been shockingly neglected by the medical establishment. Absolutely shockingly neglected. And I, for, for, for th the three years until May this year, I was chair of the executive council of the Division of Sleep Medicine at Harvard, and I'm taking the sleep guys to the Jocelyn Clinic next door to introduce them to the head of the goddamn Jocelyn Clinic, the, big, the, the most important diabetes clinic in the goddamn world. And they're, they're on the same goddamn block. And I had to take the sleep guys in there to meet the... Oh, anyway. Uh, our biggest competitor is ignorance, largely physician ignorance of the signs and symptoms. We're the leading global technology company in this space. We have the track record to prove it. 
and this is a marathon and we are only lacing our shoes, we will actually be in 10 years' time 15 billion in revenues. It's time for the nation and the world to wake up to sleep and eventually it will. Thank you very much.